So, perhaps the most elementary observation in associative learning is that when you change the relationship between two events, organisms that are observing that relationship change, change their behavior to reflect the fact that they notice it. This is true whether the relationship you're talking about is between two events which are outside the world, such as they are in Pavlovian conditioning, or whether the relationship is between two events, one of which is an animal's behavior, and the other of which is some event in the world, as it is instrumental learning. And it's true whether the change that you're arranging involves the institution of a new relationship between two things, as it does in acquisition, or the change involves the destruction of an old relationship, as it does in extinction. Uh, this first slide shows an example of the kinds of changes I'm talking about. This, these data come from a simple animal learning situation in which a rat is placed in a chamber with a hole in the wall, uh, and occasionally food can appear in the hole in the wall. The hole in the wall is called a food magazine. That food is signaled by a diffuse auditory or visual event. And as the animal learns that the signal means the coming of the food, the animal increasingly goes over to the hole in the wall, the magazine, in anticipation of the food, and sticks his head in and out of that food magazine. If you put a little photocell in front of the food magazine as we have, then you can detect his putting his head in and out during the signal before the food comes. And that's what we use as a measure of his learning to anticipate the food when we've arranged the relationship. And as you can see, looking at the left, when you arrange the relationship repeatedly, initially there's an increase in number of entries into the food magazine. And then when you destroy the relationship, as you do an extinction, there's a decrease. Now, it's common to attribute these changes in the animal's behavior to changes in underlying associative learning on the part of the animal. And we've learned over the last 50 years an amazing amount about these kinds of learning processes. We have wonderful databases, and we have elaborate theories which do a pretty good job of dealing with most of the data in the behavioral side. But there remain a great many very basic questions about the nature of associations and how it proceeds that we've been unable to answer. Questions we can't answer largely because those questions demand that we be able to compare the size of an associative change in one stimulus with that in another when the two stimuli are at very different stages of learning. And we can't make that comparison because our theories of associative learning have been very elaborate but our theories of the mapping of that associative learning into the behavioral indexes have been highly primitive. And in fact, we've mainly assumed that however the mapping occurs from what the animal knows, his association, to what he does, his behavior, whatever that mapping is, it simply preserves ordering. It only preserves the monotonicity, such that if one stimulus has more association than another, it will elicit more behavior but we've been reluctant to make stronger assumptions than that. But unless you make stronger assumptions than that, it looks like there are a lot of questions that are basic questions you can't answer. Uh, let me show you an example of what I mean. Um, perhaps the most obvious feature of this curve is what you might call the negative acceleration of the change. That is, the changes that occur in acquisition are rapid at first and then decrease. Similarly, the changes that occur in extinction are rapid at first and then decrease. And it's been common to attribute that negative acceleration in the behavior to a negative acceleration in the underlying learning process. That is to say, the associations change in the same way. But unless, <coughs> excuse me, unless you are willing to make stronger assumptions about the mapping of learning and performance, the fact that the behavior is negatively accelerated does not imply necessarily that the learning is negatively accelerated. You could perfectly well have learning which goes on in a linear fashion, but the behavior is limited physically by how often the animal can stick his head in and out of the magazine, or it's limited on the extinction side by zero. He's got to go to zero. Wherever he starts, he's going to come down to zero, and it's going to look negatively accelerated 
even if the underlying learning process is linear. But unless you make stronger assumptions about the mapping of learning performance, it's hard to see how you're going to make that inference. Of course, that hasn't prevented theorists from making the inference. That is, it's regular to assume, in theories, that learning is negatively accelerated. That was true of the early learning theories of, say, Paul and Tolan and Guthrie. It was true of so-called error correction models, which I'll talk more about today, models in which the organism is seen as comparing his current state of learning with some asymptotic level, and on every trial, changing by the amount of that error or that difference. That will naturally produce a negatively accelerated curve. And it's true of almost all connection models. Connectionistic models all assume that the learning is negatively accelerated. So theorists have been happy to make this assumption. But it would be nice to have something more than the word of theorists, because we all know that's not worth a great deal. So we thought it would be useful to see if there was some other technique we could devise that would help us to answer this question. So let me try to show you um, a way in which you can try to answer this question without strengthening your mapping assumptions. The basic, the basic idea of a negatively accelerated curve is if I give a few trials to a, a stimulus which is down low on the curve, I'll get a big increase. I give the same few trials to a stimulus which is high up on the curve, I'll get a smaller increase. That's the basic idea of negative acceleration. So if you do that, of course, you can't compare the increase you get in B and A um, unless you have stronger assumptions about mapping or unless you devise some other technique. And here's the other technique which we've tried. Let's suppose we have four stimuli. Not only your A and B, but of A, B, and C, and D. And suppose in phase one, we train up A and C, just a moderate amount. They're not untrained, they're not fully trained, somewhere in the middle. But we leave B and D untrained. Now, the question is this. If I give the same number of trials to A in phase two, as I give to B in phase two, which will undergo greater change? If the learning curve is negatively accelerated, A will undergo less change, because it's already up there, whereas B will undergo more change. But of course, I can't just look at them, because they start out here, and they come up here, and I don't know how to compare them. But I can look, not at the individual stimuli, but at the compounds. Now let's think about why looking at the compounds is going to help. Let's suppose we hadn't done phase two. We just did phase one and tested. If we did that, AD and BC should be equal because each of them, each of those compounds contains one stimulus that was trained, A or C, and one stimulus which was not, B or D. And if we've counterbalanced our stimuli, in fact, across animals, those two compounds are the same as each other. They have to equal each other. So if we hadn't done phase two, those two compounds have to be the same. But we did do phase two. And when we do phase two, that can produce some differences between responding to the compound. But the differences all have to be due to what we did in phase two. So if, for instance, we get more, we get more associative change in B than in A, then we should see more responding to BC than to AD because the increase in BC will be bigger than the increase in AD due to the fact that the increase in B was greater than the increase in A. But BC, BC and AD, in the absence of that training, start at exactly the same level. So we can now compare the magnitude of the changes because they're occurring in the same level. So that's what we did in this very first experiment. <coughs> we did magazine training. We trained up four stimuli. Two actually trained in phase one, two not. Phase two, we did some more training of A and B, same number for A and B, and then we tested. So this is what happened in that second phase, where we're now training uh, B for the first time, and A gets continued training. I've shown responding in the pre-stimulus period before any stimulus comes on, just to give you a level, an idea of how much he's sticking his head in there anyway. 
You can see that A starts out high, it's been pre-trained up here, and it goes up some, not surprisingly. B starts out, of course, low, and it appears to go up more. And it looks like we got more change in B than A, but of course this is the problem. We don't know how to make that comparison because we might, A might be stuck on the ceiling. So we're going to now test the compound. When you test the compound, we see that we get more responding to BC than to AD. That must have meant we got more learning in B from a fixed number of trials than we did in A from that same fixed number of trials. That is to say, we got negatively accelerated changes because we got more learning in B than A. And we can make that comparison by looking at the compounds in a way which doesn't require any strong assumptions about the mapping of learning and performance. Now you're going to say, well, now why do you go through this long song and dance? I thought I knew learning was negatively accelerated. He told me I didn't know learning was negatively accelerated, and then he told me it's negatively accelerated after all. What's the point of it all? Well, I think it's very important in science to make a distinction between those things you actually know and those things which you only pretend to know, right? And if you look in the history of discussion of science, you'll see I'm not, of course, the first to have thought of this. So, for instance, just to pick an Eastern scholar, Confucius said, real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. And we thought we knew the answer to that, but in fact, if you looked, you didn't really know the answer. And Hazlitt, who is one of my favorite essayists of the um, 18th century in, in England, said, the origin of false science is the unwillingness to acknowledge our ignorance. And I think that's right. So a lot of work I've done over the years has in fact had this structure where we think we know something, but if you look at it carefully, you don't, and you ask the question, what does it really take to know it? And try to answer that question. So in this case, it turns out we were right. Negative acceleration is occurring in the underlying associated process, in acquisition. But of course, the same question arises in extinction. And it's useful to ask how would we address the question in extinction. And the next figure shows the analogous issue in extinction. In extinction, you're negatively accelerated if the changes you would get from, say, two trials early in extinction are greater than the changes you'd get from those same two trials late in extinction. So let's ask how could we address that using this compound test. Well, here's one way. It's a little more complicated experiment because you have to train before you can extinguish. So it starts out training four stimuli, A, B, C, and D, two are auditory, two are visual. They're trained up essentially to acetone, fully trained. And then two stimuli, A and C, get a moderate amount of extinction. Enough to bring them down some, but not enough to take them all the way down. So now the question is, if I give the same number of extinction trials to A, which has been pre-extinguished, and B, which is not, which will undergo greater loss? And the logic is really the same. If I don't do that extinction phase two, then these two compounds have to be the same. They each contain one stimulus which has been moderately extinguished and one of which is not. And if again with counterbalancing, they really are the same across different animals. So there's no way they could be different. So if I see a difference out here after, ex after extinction two, the difference has to be due to what I did in extinction two. And that's going to tell me which one of those underwent greater loss. <coughs> so that's exactly what we did again with that magazine approach situation. So here's what happens in the test. Pre-period, things are very low. AD shows a moderate amount of responding. BC shows a lot less. That means that the decrease we got from those extinction trials on B must have been greater than the decrease we got on A, which is to say the decrease early in extinction was greater than the decrease late in extinction in the association. 
So again, just about any assumption we make which preserves monotonic mapping is going to be able to use this kind of test to make the inference that the extinction was also negatively accelerated. And this, again, is something we've looked at in lots of preparations, and I've just shown you an example in, uh, in the magazine approach because it's convenient. <coughs> now, early on I said that one reason people thought learning might be negatively accelerated is due to error correction models. Models which say the organism compares its current state with some end state, treats that as an error, changes some constant amount of that. And a, a uh, primitive early example of an, er of an error correction model is the Rescorla Wagner model, which I've shown you here. And let me just walk you through it a minute because we're going to need some of this. I've shown what happens according to that model two kinds of trials. Trials upon which stimulus A is followed by US, and trials upon which stimulus compound A and B together is followed by US. And the expressions simply tell you the amount of change in association is supposed to happen when you do that. So, the change in associative strength, VA, this theory uses VA as a, as a sign for association. Change in associative strength of VA is a constant K proportion of the difference between the current associative strength, VA, and some asymptote lambda. So the organism use its current associative strength, his asymptote looks at that as a difference, and changes some constant amount of that difference. So as he does that, of course, the difference gets smaller over trials, and so the, you'll get a negatively accelerated acquisition curve. I mean, that's how it's constructed. So the simple AUS trials are very old-fashioned, really. What was new in this model was assumptions that were made about the AB trials. Again, the same idea is there. The animal is calculating an error and correcting himself. But it, what's interesting in this version of this kind of model is that when the animal identifies the error, he takes into account the current strength, not only of the stimulus which is changing, but also the other stimulus which is there on the trial. So the change in A depends upon the current strength of A and B. And that is uh, that current strength of that compound is calculated in this model, and this is not really essential, by simple linear addition. So that's what allows this model to explain modern phenomena which have been so important in conditions like blocking. Let me remind you what blocking is, because blocking is probably the most important thing to happen in conditioning in the last 50 years. If you pre-train one stimulus, call it A, to asymptote, and then add to A, B, and follow it by the same US. That B stimulus, despite the fact it's followed by a US, will be blocked in its conditioning by the prior training of A. So prior training of A enables A to prevent conditioning of B if A accompanies B when it's reinforced. If A hadn't been there, B get lots of conditioning. But A being there blocks it. This model says the reason that happens is that the animal is trying to calculate the error, but he's using both A and B. So when I pre-trained A, A is already high, the sum of A and B is already high, so there'll be no change in B on those trials because there's no error. They've been very successful models, and they have done a great job not only predicting old things, but generating new predictions. Um, but such models, despite, despite the fact they're very popular and extend to connectionistic networks as well, such models make a very strong prediction. A prediction which, if you were just looking in the abstract, you'd think, boy, I've got to test that one, but it's never been tested. And the strong prediction is that on that trial where A and B are followed by the same US, A and B change in the same direction by the same amount. So no matter how different they are before the trial, one can be very high and one can be very low, as a result of the trial, if they're both reinforced together, they both have to change the same way and the same amount. 
right? That's a very strong prediction. It's very unlikely to be true. But all these models make that prediction, and it's been impossible to test. Because to test it, you have to compare the associative change you get in A, which is already high, with the associative change you get in B, which is very low, and you don't know whether the changes are the same or not. But using the compound technique I've been talking about, you can ask that question. And you can decide whether this strong prediction is right or not. So I want to show you an example of several experiments which have done that, because they turn out to have interesting different features. The first one was a design which was intended to provide a very strong test. We decided we'd take an A and a B, we'd reinforce them together, but we would give them as different beginning associative strengths as we could manage. So we used what's called a conditioned inhibition paradigm. That's a pre-train. Where A gets reinforced on its own, making it very strong, but not reinforced when B is there. Making B a very strong inhibitor, because B predicts that A will not be reinforced. So you end up with an A which is way up here, and a B which is way down here. And we did that for one pair AB, another receiver. And then we asked, what would happen if we take this compound, which has a very high element and a very low element, and we reinforce the compound? Will these two elements change the same amount as these theories all say it should? Now, if you think about it, I think you could convince yourself any of three outcomes are reasonable. It could be that when I reinforce AB, A will change more than B. Because after all, the organism's already identified A as a good predictor. He's already attending to it, if you're an intentional theorist, in such a way as you might expect he'd blame A for any increase, and so A would increase more than B. Or you might expect B would undergo a bigger change. Because after all, B as an individual stimulus is very far from the prediction. And if I had if I reinforced them separately, A on some trials and B on other trials, surely B would change more than A. Or you might think they'll change by exactly the same amount, which is what error correction models say. So it's really useful if we could figure out a way to answer it. And the claim I'm making is we can answer it by testing compounds. So let's think about the test. Let's suppose we hadn't done this conditioning phase. When we now present AD and BC, they ought to be equal, because each of them contains one stimulus which is excitatory, A or C, and one stimulus which is inhibitory, B or D. And although the stimulus was made inhibitory with somebody else, it should transfer its inhibition to the other stimulus. Certainly the same amount, they're simply transferring different directions. So if I hadn't done this conditioning phase, those two would be the same. So now we can ask, are they the same when we test them? If it turns out, for instance, that BC is bigger than AD, that's got to mean B picked up more than A on those trials. If it turns out that AD is bigger than BC, that turns out that A must have picked up more. If they're still equal, that means they picked up the same amount. And we're starting in the before, if we hadn't done this, from the very same level, so we don't have to worry about this level of problem. So here's what happens when we test them. When you test them, you find out the animal shows responding to AD and responding to BC, but the responding is much greater than BC. What that means is that B must have gained more on those AB trials than did A. That means the inhibitory stimulus, B, showed more increase than the excitatory stimulus, A. They don't change by the same amount. All the theories which assume they're going to change by the same amount are wrong. We couldn't have known that without this kind of compound test. Now, this is very important because it's not only bad for the squirrel Wagner model, which, all right, we can look about that, but it's bad for a whole host of other models, including a lot of error correction models that are out there, network models, all make this assumption that they change by the same amount. 
And if they don't change by the same amount, those models don't work. It requires not a trivial assumption that those models made, they're essential for them to work. Now this is one of many experiments we've done like this. We've used not only an exciter and inhibitor, but we've used other stimuli like an exciter and a neutral stimulus. We've used other conditioning preparations. And we've looked at extinction. And in extinction, the one that changes more is the excitatory stimulus, not the inhibitor. So there's, this is one of an example of a broad class of experiments which say these two stimuli do not change the same amount on trial. There are differences, and differences are going to cause trouble. Now, one variation that's of particular interest if you're in this game is a variation in which you don't simply move the same reinforcer from the stage one to the same reinforcer here, but you change the size of the reinforcer. And I want to tell you about an experiment which does that because it provides us with additional information. Let's suppose we do the same experiment, except that the reinforcer we use in phase one is stronger, which I've indicated by a double plus, than the reinforcer we use in stage two. Now think about stage two. When we follow the AB compound in stage two, from the point of view of the B stimulus, that's an increase in reinforcement. But from the point of view of the A stimulus, that's a decrease in the reinforcement. And if I had trained the A, a trained in phase one, and then trained A with a single reinforcer and B with a single reinforcer, they would move together. They would both move in the middle. The A stimulus would come down because it's experiencing a decrease in reinforcement value, and the B would come up. So any error correction model which says, no, 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 this compound stuff is wrong, each stimulus changes as an error, as an individual stimulus toward its own error, it should produce conversion of A and B here. But error correction models that say you have a common error term, like the squirrel wagon model, say that despite the fact that A is now being followed by a weaker reinforcement than it was out here, it will go up. And it will go up because the AB compound is under predicting the reinforcer. I still have an error because the B is inhibitory, keeping the prediction down. So the squirrel wagon model says A and B will both go up. They'll both go up by the same amount. Individual error correction models say, no, A will come down and B will come up. So it's of interest to ask, what happens? And the test is the same. In this case, it's useful to test the individual stimuli. And we can learn something about it. Because notice that we, one of our, if you take, for instance, A and C, one of those two stimuli, A got this additional training, but C did not. So by looking at A and C, we can ask, did A go up or down? Because A is being trained and C is a control stimulus. Similarly, by B and D, we can ask, did B go up or down? Of course, we can't figure out which one went up or down more, but that's what we got the compound test for. So let's look at the individual elements first. The squirrel wagon model says A and B will both go up. And it turns out, the squirrel wagon models, right this time, it happens. Um, so that B went up, and A went up. Notice A went up, even though it's now being followed by a weaker reinforcer than it had before. Because it's being followed by that weaker reinforcer in compound with B. So, one point for the squirrel wagon model, and the one is like it. But we can't tell which one went up more. It actually kind of looks like maybe A went up more, but it's hard to make sense out of them. There are different parts of the scale. So which one went up more? This is not so good for the squirrel wagon model. This time, if you look, and it's like the previous result, it looks like B went up more than A, because BC is more responsive <coughs> than AD. So when you do this experiment, they both go up, they go up together, they don't converge, but they go up by different amounts. So it's not good for anybody. It's not good for the single error correction, single term error correction models, because they both go up. 
uh, converge. It's not good for the compound or correction models because they don't change by the same amount. So there's a real problem here with regard to any class of error correction model. Again, this is just one example of a lot of experiments we've done like it. Um, we've done it in auto shaping and flavor aversion of various other kinds of situations. So the compound technique, which allows us to make this assessment, has really led us to make serious inroads into questioning about an important theoretical question that we couldn't have answered before. So already the compound techniques got a lot going for them. But it turns out the compound technique will allow you to answer lots of other questions we need to answer about associative learning. So I want to tell you about some other cases where we applied it to other similar situations. One question which I've always thought was interesting is, what does it matter what the initial value of the signaling stimulus is? What does it matter what the value of the condition stimulus is before you do conditioning? Now, in fact, if you look at conditioning experiments, people go to all sorts of lengths not to use CSs which have initial value. In fact, if you read traditional descriptions of Pavlovian conditioning, they'll say, in conditioning, you take a neutral stimulus, and you follow it by some important stimulus, and the neutral stimulus changes. So we have almost no experiments in which we don't take a neutral stimulus. We take always neutral stimulus. We don't ask what, that, what difference does the initial value of the stimulus matter. But that's an important question about the nature of association. Is the learning the same regardless of the initial value, or does the initial value make a difference? Now, of course, in traditional conditioning preparations, most of our CSs have been carefully picked to be neutral, so we have to find one in which they're not neutral if we want to study this. And it turns out that the flavor aversion preparation is a preparation in which you have natural stimuli for doing this. Some years ago, we did a bunch of experiments <coughs> with four flavors. Sugar, sweet, salt, salty, bitter, quinine, and sour mild hydrochloric acid. Now it turns out that with some mixing of the different concentrations, you can arrange it so two of those stimuli are mildly positive, sweet and salt. And you can match them against the water and get them to the same level of positivity in a choice situation. And two of them are mildly negative, quinine, bitter, and sour hydrochloric acid. And you can again match them for their level of negativity. And so now you can ask, well, what would happen if I try to condition a negative stimulus and a positive stimulus using something like a negative consequence, like lithium chloride, which is commonly used, makes the animal um, feel sick and makes him reject substances. And you can use those stimuli and that kind of conditioning you have to answer this question of what difference does it make? Now again, you can imagine three plausible answers. If I have a stimulus which is inherently negative, and I try to condition it to be negative, will it be especially good at that? As I think a lot of clinical uh, psychologists think it would. If you think back to the example of uh, phobias, where spiders are always pointed out as easy to be phobic of, and, and flowers are not, the assumption is they've got some initial negativity, and that makes them especially susceptible to negative conditioning. So you might think, that an initially negative stimulus would be easy to condition negatively. Or you might think that it would be hard to, 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 excuse me, to condition because it's already part way there. If it had been made negative by some conditioning operation, it would be like it's on the negatively accelerated acquisition curve. So it could be the unconditioned negativity would function just like conditioned negativity and make it undergo less change. Or they could be unaffected could be the positive and negative initial stimuli don't matter, the amount of change it gets the same. Um, it just builds on top of the initial uh, difference. So here's a way to try to address it. For this experiment, we have two positive and two negative stimuli. I've called them P1 and P2 and so forth. The P1 and P2 are sugar and salt, counterbalance, and the N1 and N2 are um, hydrochloric acid and quinine counterbalance. 
The same animal now gets conditioned to one positive, P1, and one negative, N1. And now we ask, what does he do to the compounds? Now again, let's go back and imagine we hadn't done the conditioning. If we hadn't done the conditioning and we presented those two compounds, they ought to be equal. Each of them contains one positive stimulus, inherently positive, and one inherently negative stimulus. And if they're counterbalanced, there's no way they could be different. So if we get a difference out here between those two compounds, if the first compound, P1N2, is greater than the second, that means that the positive stimulus must have undergone greater change than the negative stimulus. Right. So the first time we did the experiment, we did it with the thick chloride, conditioning a positive and negative stimulus with a negative consequence. So the conditioning, if you use a negative consequence, looks like this. I put in red down here. I hardly ever use color, but I felt moved to do it this time. Um, put in red down here the stimulus which had been conditioned. So the positive stimulus was conditioned in this, in this uh, bar and the negative in this bar. And what I plot here is the amount of conditioning. It's a funny, you can worry about what the index was the detail later, but that's the amount of conditioning. And what you can see here is we got more conditioning if we trained the positive stimulus that if we train the negative stimulus. Right? This is with aversive training. Now, unlike the other situation we've been talking about, this positive and negative stimulus cannot necessarily be thought to be equally salient. Right? They're not counterbalanced because they're positive and negative. The other stimulus, they're all counterbalanced. We have to worry about, we didn't have to worry about this. But here it could just be that our positive stimuli are easy to train and our negative stimuli are not easy to train, has nothing to do with the fact that we train them with aversive stimuli. So it's important to do the experiment not only with an aversive consequent, but with a positive consequent. So it turns out you can do that too. You can pair these stimuli, not with lithium chloride, but with a healthy concentration of sucrose and polycose. Concentration is something which rats love. So I can make something into a positive stimulus by pairing it with this positive compound. So now I can do the same experiment, but now use a positive consequence. Again, conditioning P1 and N1. And with the repetitive consequent, I get the opposite result. With the repetitive consequent, now the negative stimulus shows the worst conditioning compared to the positive stimulus. So what this means is that if I have an inherently attractive stimulus, it will be easier to make negative or easier to increase its negativity, I should say, than if I have inherently negative stimulus. So it's the inherent value is acting like a conditioned value. So the stimulus will be easy to change, or will change a lot, if there is a very large discrepancy between its inherent value and the consequent. Right? So the pipe spider flower story that's told by clinicians is just backwards here. Now related to inherent value are several, are several issues about acquired value. And we, or we might ask questions about how easy is it to train various stimuli which have various kinds of acquired states. So one question which is related to this one is how hard is it to retrain a stimulus after extinction? Now if you read any conditioning or for that matter introductory textbook, they'll tell you the stimulus has been trained and extinguished, it's easy to retrain. Easier to train than a stimulus that's not been trained and extinguished. So retraining is faster than initial training. But if you think about that, you realize there's an inherent ambiguity in that. Is retraining faster? Because the stimulus which is undergoing retraining undergoes fast associative change. Or is it faster? because the stimulus which is undergoing retraining was never really fully extinguished, and it simply has a head start. So is the retraining stimulus smart, so it learns quickly, or has it a head start, because you didn't ever take it back to zero? And they're very different. So we can ask the question, well, is it really true that the associative level, 
retraining is faster than initial training? Or is that an, an, uh, an accident of our behavioral measures? So here's a way to ask that question. Take two stimuli, A and C. Train them up to asymptote. Fully trained. Now, extinguish A and C. Again, fully extinguish them. B and D you have hanging around that you haven't any training on. Now I try to retrain A, that's retraining, or for the first time, train B. Now, that's the usual comparison. How fast will A come up? How fast will B come up? And typically you see A comes up faster. But you don't really know if that means there was greater associative change in A or in B. All you know is you have more behavior. So in order to make the comparison, we have to do something like a compound test. And again, imagine we didn't do the retraining. When we test AD, we have a stimulus, which we have a compound which has one stimulus which has been extinguished A and one which has not been trained D. We test BC, we have a compound which has one stimulus which has been extinguished C and a B which has not been trained. So we had none retraining, they're the same. So now the question is, did retraining produce more associative change in the previously extinguished stimulus or the previously untrained stimulus? So we can ask, did we get more associative change when we retrain or when we did initial acquisition? Now here's what happens in the usual test when we simply look at how A and B change. And you can see that A comes up very rapidly and B comes up much less rapidly. Right? That's, those are the data that are usually used to say retraining is faster than initial training. But you'll notice there's this awkward fact that they're a little different to begin with. Right? And you can be sure you're always going to see that if you look carefully. Right? So it's really a lousy comparison. So we have to ask about the compound. And it turns out when you test the compound, you get more responding to BC. That means you got more responding, more increase to B than you did to A. In fact, when you did retraining, although behaviorally the A stimulus went up faster, in fact, it was learning less. The neutral stimulus is learning more. Right? And the reason, I think, is pretty clear. It's because the faster retraining is due to the fact that the extinction was just never fully complete. And so it looks like faster retraining, and it is in terms of behavior, but it's not faster learning. It's faster showing of learning that was already there before. So what this means is that retraining is due to incomplete extinction, not due to um, the fact that the stimulus actually acquires the association more rapidly after extinction. And you may say, okay, that's okay, that's interesting. But it's a very important difference that you need to know the answer to. Now, there's a very similar case where you don't look at retraining, comparing a retrained stimulus with a neutral stimulus, but you compare the training of a conditioned inhibitor with a neutral stimulus. A standard way of assessing whether a stimulus is a conditioned inhibitor or not is to try to train it as an exciter and compare how fast it trains with how fast a neutral stimulus trains. And the faster behavior to a neutral stimulus is taken as evidence that the inhibitor is inhibitory. But here's the question. Did the inhibitor acquire its behavior more slowly because it started at such a severe disadvantage? Or did it acquire it more slowly because it's hard to turn the inhibitor around. It's hard to convince the stimulus now that it ought to have the opposite value. That is, the associative learning is slow. So I think, again, we tend to confuse these in our discussions. Um, but they're very important. Is an inhibitor slow to become an exciter? Or is it becoming an exciter fast, but just starts from so low we don't see it? And again, you have to have the compound test to answer that. So here's an experiment to answer. 
In this experiment, we took, we used five stimuli. This is never more than five. Uh, we used five stimuli. One stimulus I'll call an X. It's simply an exciter that's used to train two inhibitors. So we train X as an exciter, and A and C as inhibitors, and we leave B and D as neutral. <coughs> now we ask, who trains faster, A, an inhibitor, or B, a neutral stimulus? And we're going to compare the compounds, too. So let's look first at phase two, which is where the usual data come from. Phase two, I've shown you how <coughs> responding develops in the pre-stimulus period. In the A stimulus, which starts out as an inhibitor, and the B stimulus, which starts out neutral. And you can see behavior develops more rapidly in B than in A. That's the standard evidence, retardation test is sometimes called, that A is an inhibitor. It, started, it comes up more slowly than the neutral stimulus. But of course we don't know, did A come up more slowly because it was having trouble learning, or did A come up more slowly because it started at such a disadvantage? Looking at the compound tells you the answer. In the compound, we can ask, who showed more increase, A or B, associated increase? And it turns out that AD shows more responding than BC. That means A, the inhibitor, A, the inhibitor, underwent greater associative change than B, the neutral stimulus. It, in fact, learned faster. It's just it learned from such a disadvantage, it had a long way to go. And that's not really surprising if you believe in error correction models. In error correction models, which has the bigger error? A neutral stimulus, which is here from the asymptote, or an inhibitor, which is here? So the inhibitor on each trial is, in fact, learning more, but it just has trouble catching up. Now again, in a way, if you want to just decide you would have an inhibitor or not, it doesn't matter. But if you want to understand what's going on in the nature of the process, to measure the, which stimulus is undergoing more associative change, you have to use something like the compound test. And it gives a kind of surprising answer, that the inhibitor is in fact undergoing fast associative learning. Another example. This is an example which is close to the heart of theorists. One question which has been of interest to theorists is, is the learning process faster in acquisition or in extinction? Do you undergo acquisition faster or slower do you undergo ex extinction? Now, if you actually look at behavior in the kind of graph I showed you before, it sure looks like the changes are faster in extinction. And this is pretty typical. But if you ask theorists to tell you about what's sometimes called the rate parameter, how fast does learning happen, and how fast does extinction happen, they'll all tell you acquisition happens faster than extinction, despite those data. Theorists often don't care about it. So, the question is, are they right? Are theorists right that, in fact, acquisition is faster than extinction in the face of data like those? Now, that's just not an arbitrary distinction that um, theorists are making. Many theories, in order to explain certain phenomena, require that acquisition be faster than extinction. If it's not, certain phenomena simply can't be believed. So it's an important question, but it's really hard to see how you're going to answer that question. I mean, you're asking if I give three trials to a stimulus here, which I'm asking to go up, and three trials to a stimulus here, which I'm asking to go down, which change more? So you've got not only the problem that they're changing in different levels, but they're changing in different directions. So how can you ever ask, which one really was faster? Well, it turns out, won't surprise you, that the compound test allows you to answer that. It's a little different variation on it, but it does address it. So here's how it goes. Four stimuli. A and B, C and D, A and C are trained. Now think of phase two as reversing the A-B discriminant the A, B discrimination, but not the C, D. Just a way to think of it. So what we've done, we train A and C, not B and D, and then we reverse the training of A and B 
to keep constantly training on CPD. Now, of course, if we hadn't done any of this phase, and we now tested AB, that would be equal to CD. Because AB contains one trained and one non-trained stimulus, and CD contains one of each. But when we test that, if we test AB versus CD, we can ask, what changed more, A or B? If A went down more than B, came up, then AB would be less than CD. If A went down less than B came up, then AB would be greater than CD. So we can ask, who changed more, A or B? Because if we hadn't changed them, they would be equal to CD. So here's what happened during the second phase. It's a kind of cluttered graph, but here's where things were before we engaged in phase two, this is the end of phase one. Two stimuli are high, two are low, and there's a pre stimulus So now, in the second phase, C is just treated the same as it always was and stays up. D is treated the same as it always was and stayed down. But A is extinguished, and B is conditioned. So the question is, they, been, they both change in the right directions. The question is, is the underlying associative change, the decrease in A, greater or less than the increase in B? Now, it kind of looks like the decrease in A was greater than the increase in B. But of course, the problem is we can't compare them. The only way to compare them is to look at that compound. And so if, in fact, A has gone down faster than B has come up, then AB will be less than CD. That's not what happened. In fact, AB is greater than CD. And AB being greater than CD means that A underwent less change than B. B went up more than A went down when I did the same number of trials on. So A went up faster in acquisition than B went down in extinction. So the theorists are right. Sort of an accident, Paul. But they're right that in fact, acquisition is faster than extinction. And now we can actually make the comparison the first time. Now I have one final experiment to confuse you with. In this experiment, the reason that we trained C and D in the same old way was we were worried that what we did to AB would generalize to CD. And we wanted to hold CD where they were by continuing to treat them the same way. So we didn't have to worry about any generalization of the other treatment. But it turns out that if you don't hold C and D and change the experiment slightly, you can ask a related question. And the related question is this. When I train a stimulus, it will generalize some amount to other stimuli that are similar. When I extinguish the stimulus, it will generalize too. Which generalizes more, acquisition or extinction? It turns out that's been a historically very important question. But it's really hard to know how we're going to answer that question. Because when we look at extinction of acquisition, it's up here looking like this. We look at extinction of, uh, generalization of extinction, it's down here looking like this. And how do I compare the weights? of these two things. Well, people have been happy to do it, but they shouldn't have. So it turns out that a somewhat variation on this experiment will allow us to answer that question. So here's the design. Looks very much like the last one, except I've changed them to emphasize the stimulus similarities. So I got two stimulus dimensions, A and B. And in this example, the two exemplars of A a1 and A2 are both trained. The two exemplars of the B dimension, B1 and B2, are both not trained. Then we extinguish the A dimension, A1, but we don't, I'm sorry, and we train B1. And then we test these compounds. So let me walk you through the logic of why we're doing this, this kind of opaque kind of thing. And the logic turns out not to be that easy to see unless you do it step by step. I can never remember. So let me show you how the logic goes. 
One other thing. The experiments are done in such a way that this first stage is complete. That is, we're asymptotic at the end of stage one, and we're also asymptotic at the end of stage two. There are details about why you have to do that, but you know, in any case, that we've done that. So now, let's suppose that we find that A, B is greater, that's right, A1, B1 is greater than A1, B2. Let's suppose that's the result when we test these. That suggests that the difference between A1 and B1 is less than the difference between A1, B1, I'm sorry, the difference between B1 and B2 is greater than the difference between A2 and A1. All I did was simply algebraic move, move B over to here, B2 over to here, and A1 over to here. Right? All I did was change sides of the equation for two of those 10 elements. So if the first one's true, then the second's going to be true. Okay? If the second one is true, that says the difference between B, the treated stimulus, B1, and B2, the generalized stimulus, that difference is greater than the difference on the A's between the treated and the not treated and the generalized stimulus. So the B's are further apart than the A's. That means that B1 has generalized less than A1. Because B1 is more different from B2, it must have generalized less than A1 and A2. But that in ten sense means that reinforcement generalized less than non-reinforcement. You have to write it down and go over it in your head five or six times. But the logic is right, that if we find that, that the A1, B1 compound is greater than the A2, B2 compound, that's telling us that reinforcement generalizes less than non-reinforcement. And for the first time, we can really answer that question in a meaningful way. Now, these are just the data from phase two to show you that, in fact, the training, the extinction, and the acquisition were complete. This matters because these are happening at different rates. And you don't want those rates confounding things. You want this all, both of these to be completely done with what they're doing. But we worry about that later. Here's the test. The test result was A1, B1 is greater than A2, B2. And I'm sure you all remember what that means. That means that reinforcement generalized less than non-reinforcement. So in fact, it's true that the breadth of generalization is greater when you extinguish than when you reinforce. Turns out theoretically to be a very important issue. So, this is, these are a whole set of examples of how you can use this compound technique to answer a bunch of questions. So let me review with you exactly how we tried to use it. First question we looked at was the shape of the learning curve. Um, now here we thought we knew the answer. We thought it was negatively accelerated. I tried to convince you you didn't know the answer, but you really did. That is, if you test it in the right way, the answer you thought you knew was right, but you had to test it in the right way. So we actually didn't know the answer before. We've used it to try to evaluate important error correction models, and for the first time, I think we provided decisive problems for major error correction models. Not that the Rishkorla Wagner model was without problems before, but this is a really major problem, because this is an inherent assumption it can't avoid. And it turns out to be wrong. Things do not change by the same amount. But we couldn't know that until we had the compound test. We asked what would happen about conditioning with value stimulant. This is a question which basically we've been reluctant to ask before. But now we can ask it, and we can get an answer. And the answer is that we get an amount of conditioning which was the same as if the inherent value were conditioned instead of inherent. We ask about stimuli at different starting points, such as, um, such as condition inhibitor and neutral stimulus, and such as a retrained stimulus. And there we were able to make an important distinction between two stimuli being different because they start at different places or because they change at different rates. We ask about changes in difference in direction, um, where we can now ask, is the decrease in extinction the same or or different from the increase in acquisition. 
And then we ask about stimulus generalization, where I think there's been some cross. Now, this technique is not without its problems. It's not a perfect solution. Sad to say there never is. But, for instance, it assumes that the compounds don't introduce anything which is not in the elements. That is, there's not some new process which occurs when you put things together in compound. That's a very common assumption most people make it, but it is an assumption. We've also assumed that we can somehow take the elements of a compound and add them together. Right? The easiest way to think of is it's linear addition. But of course, everybody does assume you can add them together somehow, and it turns out it doesn't make much difference for this kind of, this kind of a compound test, how you add them together. So it seems to me, this is a technique which has a lot of problems. It's already generated a lot of data, which I think are of interest. And especially in the case of stimulus generalization, we've just scratched the, stim the surface of what controls the amount of stimulus generalization. It allows us for a, a way to ask about whether we get different amounts of stimulus generalization in different parameters. So I think this is a technique which is useful already, and which shows a great deal of promise. And I hope some of you who are out there who are younger and not quitting the game like I am will actually use the technique to some extent. Thank you very much. Somebody else isn't cleverer than I am and couldn't find some way to put it together. No, I just didn't have the phone. 